Welcome to the Culinary Treasure Podcast. I'm Stephen Shalma, your host. So excited today. I'm in Manzanita, Oregon on the Oregon coast. I've um, got a fantastic guest for you today and an amazing story. If you want to see all of our Oregon coast-centric content, um, be it culinary podcasts, craft beer podcasts, travel articles, or this is Culinary Treasure articles, I invite you to go to adventuresontheoregoncoast.com, www.adventuresontheoregoncoast.com. So today finds us at McGregor's Whiskey Bar, and uh, the one and only Chip McGregor is our host. Chip, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. It is delighted to have you here. You know, I've done a little bit of FM radio my day, and I know you've been told this a million times. You have an amazing voice, voice for radio. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Thanks. You know, I'm a twin, and my twin brother, John, has uh, spent his life in radio. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. And has his voice similar to yours? Almost as good? You know, it's it's hard to say, but he he is he's been doing Alaskan public radio for years and years. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, questions ask all my guests on all my podcasts. Um, where were you born? So I was born at Emanuel Hospital in Portland, Oregon. And um, where did you go to high school? I graduated from Hillsborough High School, which is just west of Portland. And uh, what's your what was the mascot there? The Hillsborough Spartans. Cheer blue and white team, let our banners fly. We will hoist the glories of our Spartans to the sky. Rah, rah, rah. Now that's a podcast first. I've heard anybody sing their song before. Some people can't even remember their mascot. I like that. All right. So um, your your professional journey has been in publishing, um, in books. That's where I actually first met you. We were both, we were both speaking at the same book uh, conference of some kind, which was a blast. Um and you were a literary agent, and you've lived some fun places. You live New York, you've lived Denver, you live Nashville, you've lived a couple of places. Um, but you moved out to the Oregon coast. Uh, what year roughly did you move out here? 2009, right? Yeah, 2009. You moved to the Oregon coast. And what brought you? Why, why the Oregon coast? When I was a kid, um, so I'm the youngest in a big family. And, you know, when you got like six kids at home and a couple of blue-collar working parents, uh, the only thing you can really afford to do is go out to the coast, let the kids run around, play in the sand, beat on each other, play in the waves. And so um, I had great memories of coming out here to Cannon Beach and to Rockaway and to Manzanita and to Seaside. And um, so I had been living in New York and then down in Nashville and uh, the company I was working for got sold. And I sort of looked around and I thought, you know, I'm turning 50. Uh, maybe it's time I move someplace I'd really like to live. So I came back to Manzanita. All right. And it's been home ever since. Yeah, absolutely. And you love it. I do. Actually, I love being here. It's it, The vibe is great. Good. Yeah, it is, it is a... Um, I just love the Oregon coast. Manzanita is just one of the wonderful communities. Um, uh, just a lot of lot of phenomenal stuff around here. I could wax elegant. I've done lots of cool podcasts uh, here. Yeah, I bet. Um, you got some great restaurants right here in Manzanita. Um, uh, we'll talk about those in just a second, but for fun. But um, so, what year did you open McGregor's Whiskey Bar? So, uh, it, it kind of sprung into being in 2016. We opened the doors on D Day, June 6th, 2017. And that's, uh, and now, so people know that's Manzanita Whiskey, that's Manzanita uh, Chips, Chips Whiskey Bar in Manzanita. You also have a, excuse me, McGregor's Whiskey Bar. Goodness, come on. I haven't even been drinking yet. Maybe that's the problem. Yeah, that is um, the problem. In Cannon Beach. Yeah, so uh, we opened here four years ago in Manzanita, McGregor's uh, Whiskey Bar. And then we opened McGregor's of Cannon Beach two years ago. Uh, took over the old Morris's Fireside uh, restaurant, mm -hmm. which is the big log cabin right downtown on the corner, Hamlock and 2nd in downtown Cannon Beach. Now, actually, I think I'm going to go there tonight just to check it out, take photos. Oh, you um, should, yeah. Because I've spent a lot of time here. Um, this space is is kind of small inside, uh, but I'll tell you, if it's a cold, I was here, I think, in January, cold, rainy day, evening. It was so perfect. I loved it. You've got a couple of fire pits outside. Um, you've got a uh, an area out in the back where you put some fires on. Um, it's just quaint. I love it. Thank you. Um, uh, we're going to talk about the food menu because it is stunning. And then when you re people realize you've got like a, 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 a one foot by one foot kitchen, I don't know, the square footage is scary. I mean, I, I went, what? I looked at the menu and I'm looking like, where's the kitchen? Hats off to pull it off. Um, now, I understand that you have a little bit bigger menu uh, in Cannon Beach because you've got actual an actual kitchen. Correct. Um, so we'll have fun there. And there's how many whiskey bottles roughly are here? So in Manzanita, I think right now we've got 
200, just shy of 240. I think we've got about 237 whiskeys, brown liquors here. <laughs> Yeah, so if you love whiskey, you have got to get to McGregor's Whiskey Bar. I don't care if you go to Manzine or Cannon Beach. Um, it's an incredible experience. And then roughly how many bottles in Cannon Beach of, of Can the brown spirits? Yeah, Cannon Beach has a few more. So between 250 and 260. And uh, when, when, something, when we say something is a brown liquor, that's just, it's a whiskey which has been aged in a barrel, which is, you know, all the, basically all spirits when they come out of the still are clear. But if it's aged in a barrel, then it, it picks up a brown color from the and so, um, so that's what we've got here. Scotches, bourbons, ryes, blended whiskeys. Uh, we got rums. Yeah, those are, those are all brown. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk through the list. Um, it is absolutely phenomenal. So why a, um, why a whiskey bar? I spent my life in publishing and uh, was, really became interested in brown liquors when I worked on a couple of books that were done um, on, on whiskeys on basically on American whiskeys. Um, and when I moved here, I realized there were a couple of great little bars. There was a dive bar, uh, uh, you know, the, the lighthouse uh, up on 101. The Sand Dune Pub was here. I love the Sand Dune Pub. It's a pub with pub food and lots of beers and everything, but there wasn't a high-end bar. And uh, my wife and I were talking about it, and I don't want to leave her out of it because Holly played an essential role in this, as we just talked about. It's like, you know what this town needs? we need to think about creating a whiskey bar. And there used to be a wine bar here, and we talked about buying the wine bar and turning it into a whiskey bar. Events happened where that wasn't feasible, but the fact is, here we are several years later, and we've got a successful whiskey bar. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things you wanted, I think you said you wanted something upscale. Absolutely. Because um, that yeah. kind of fits part of this community, a big part of this community. Um, and, for example, uh, Neocani Bistro. Um, right. I, I did a podcast with uh, Isha and Lynn. And Lynn. Yeah. I love them. Great story. And they're upscale. It's Absolutely. phenomenal. And they're kind of like just, it's a perfect counterpoint because, you know, after right there, I can't, I come here and I have some whiskey. Yeah. Thanks very much. We, we love them. We send people who are really looking for a nice dinner up to Neocani Bistro all the time. Um, and, you know, Connie and Joanne own uh, Yoke, which is a great breakfast place in oh, town. Oh, yes, that's right. And so, yeah, there's good places around, but there wasn't necessarily a bar, especially the, an upscale bar. And, you know, you know, people come out here to the coast and some people have a lot of money and they're successful and they're looking for something upscale. They don't want to just hang out and, you know, I'll have a Bud Light kind of thing. You know, they're looking for something. So one of the things that we've always tried to do, in addition to having a big variety of brown liquor, is to try and have some really good top shelf stuff. So things that nobody has, things that uh, you, you can't find at your local bar. And so we've done a really good job of keeping, of keeping a, a great top shelf. I know when we start talking through the menu, there's a couple of things that caught my eye. And I went, are you kidding me? And I had him was like, oh, the steak matches the sizzle to turn a phrase. Thanks. Um, so you mentioned already one of your secret weapons, um, your wife, Holly. And she has done a, I, I wish she was here on the podcast. She's done a tremendous amount to kind of help you make it happen, as I understand it. A lot of design, a lot of the the make it happen, you know, umption in your gumption to get stuff done. Um, she's helped with the website, uh, some of the branding. Um, I, I'm, I'm Am I on target there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The, the Whiskey Bar wouldn't really exist without Holly, who was the motivation behind it and part of the planning process. So I didn't, I didn't plan all this out myself. Uh, Holly and I planned this out together. And um, there are certain things that I was strong at, like figuring out which whiskeys to have uh, and how to talk about them and stuff like that. And there were thing, things that I had a vision for, like doing a lot of flights and having a, a, a generally Celtic theme because I have a Scottish family, but I didn't want to go over the top. I didn't want it to be... You know how it is these days. You walk into like an Irish pub and they're serving, you know, Belfast nachos. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they or you can walk into a Scottish bar and they'll have, you know, bad bagpipe music going on in the background. We didn't really want that. We knew what we knew what we wanted to do. But as she and I talked about, it, it became very clear. And so Holly was great in terms of helping with design. Like you say, the websites, the, menu, the menus, uh, and it just... The whole thing is, it's a collaboration. Um, and speaking of Holly, you guys have uh, been married about four years now, been together about eight. I'm doing approximate math. So if Holly, if it's not quite right, blame me. Um, but where did you meet her? <laughs> so that is a great story because we actually met right here in this space right there. Now, you can't see this because we're not doing TV, but he is pointing to a chair in, in, in the corner. You met her in this building. Yeah, there had been... <laughs> 
<laughs> so this is funny. There had been an author in town. So uh, Manzanita has a, uh, a community center and sometimes has visiting authors come through. Deborah Reed, the famous novelist, uh, was in town doing a reading. And afterwards, she and Holly came and sat in this space when it used to be a wine bar. They were sitting in the corner and Holly was talking to her about, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to find somebody who can help me with my career. And Deborah said to her, well, you need to meet an agent. And then, and they told me that was literally the moment I walked in to the wine bar and Deborah said, oh, here's Chip McGregor. And I turned, I heard my name, hello. And um, yes, so we met right here in this space. Little did we know, that then we were gonna, you know, meet, fall in love, get married, open a wine, uh, open a whiskey bar in the space. Deborah would be in our wedding in Hawaii, and of course, then she moved to town and bought the bookstore here uh, in Manzanita. So, I know it's funny how God kind of makes all things work together. And that that's a phenomenal bookstore. Um, I've bought a number of books there my past couple of trips. I've been trying to. You know, I recently, I haven't done anything launch with it, but I got the Epic Discourse Podcast.com and I've got it going now because I wanted to tell stories that aren't food related because I, I knew that had a good story, that bookstore, and now I know more. Um, that, that is absolutely phenomenal. I kind of have goosebumps and uh, you're right. That is amazing. You guys met and now you have a whiskey bar in the exact same space. Right. Yeah. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Um, so the day you opened, you, you knew, you, I'm sure just owning a whiskey bar, you learn a lot about whiskey. Yes. But you knew some the day you opened. And what was some of the, the, the prep throughout your lifetime that kind of prepared you to own, open a whiskey bar? Sure. Like I say, I really got an interest in it uh, with some books that I was doing when I spent my life uh, uh, helping publish books. And I took some classes in it because I was interested. Um, and so I was self-taught, taking some classes, reading a bunch of books, taking a couple of whiskey courses so I could learn about it, only because it interested me. Uh, the, the, the science of it interested me, the, the art of it. One of the things in publishing uh, is that there's not like a right way to, to write, like to craft a manuscript. It, it, it's an art. It, editing, there's not like a right way to edit somebody's work. Editing is an art as much as it's a science. Whiskey making is that way as well. There is, uh, it, I, I don't know if there's one perfect bourbon, but there are a bunch of perfect bourbons. There are a bunch of really great bourbons and scotches and ryes. And, um, uh, and so I was always interested in that part of it. And I, I love history. You know, my, you know, I did graduate school in, in history. Uh, and, uh, and so I love a great story. And some of the whiskeys just have great stories behind them. Uh, and that's still happening. Like right now, there's there's a there's a new bourbon that's come out called Blackened, and you know there is uh, uh, there's a, a band behind it, um, the rock band ACDC. <laughs> you know, I, I think I heard of them. Yeah, heavy metal band and everything. And they had this idea: Hey, we're going to create we're going to create a whiskey, and we're going to put it into a, we're going to put it into a barrel, and instead of giving it time, where the barrel gets hot, the wood expands, so the liquid goes into the wood, and then it gets cold, the wood shrinks, and it's pushed out, the breathing of the whiskey in and out of the wood. Instead of that, we're going to put it in a rickhouse, and we're going to play our music. We're going to play thrash metal, and that's going to, you know, really loud through speakers, and that's going to cause the whiskey to go in and out. It's going to make it move and everything, and that was the theory behind it. And the fact is, Blackened is great, so who knew? <laughs> I wish people could, I wish we were filming because your enthusiasm, your passion, your love for whiskey, it's palpable. Um, you studied, you took classes. I suspect that even before Open Whiskey Square, I did a little bit of, of drinking and whiskey as your prep. Uh, just a little bit. I just, you know. <laughs> I, uh... In all seriousness, drinking wasn't really a big part of your life. Not a big deal. Um, but you did have a moment where things really came together for you for whiskey. That's true. Whiskey, the funny thing is, in terms of imbibing, I love a great scotch. Um, or I'll have, you know, maybe it's like having a glass of wine with, with a steak. But I've never been a huge drinker. Um, and so, yeah, it's not that I wanted to sit down in my own bar and have free drinks and get sloshed every night. Uh, again, I, I like the taste. I think that there's a lot, the, the art of pairing food with alcohol is great fun. And you can experiment with things, just like you can experiment with uh, stages of, uh, you know, different stages in distilling in the process. But I did have a moment where I just realized um, 
that my life had changed. And I was, I was a publisher with Time Warner. Uh, I was in New York. We were at the Ritz-Carlton. Um, and there was a publishing event going on. And so there were some really important people around us. I remember um, uh, there was a Hall of Fame baseball player, and I think the governor was there and there was, you know, powerful people and they were sitting around. I'll be fair, there's a lot of guys and um, uh, and we have tried, we have really worked hard to make sure that women become part of this world. But I was sitting there and the guy next to me says, I don't have a scotch, you want one? Yeah. Uh, and he said, uh, what do you want? So of course I'm, what are you having? And he says, because you, did, you didn't really know scotch that much at that point. No, I, I knew some about it, just enough to be dangerous, you know. Not enough to order the right kind in exactly. front of someone you need to impress. Exactly, yeah. And he says, well, I was thinking of having an Isla. And, of course, I was like, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> you didn't know what that was, did you? I, no, I didn't. I, I knew that there was an Isla region in Scotland because my family's from Scotland. But beyond that, I really did not know. And uh, he said, um, I was thinking maybe, maybe I'll get a log of Ulan. Um, and I happened to be looking down at the menu, at the, at the list, and I, saw, and I said, oh, they've got the Log of Ulan 16. Great, he says. He's like, oh, you must be a connoisseur. And, uh, <laughs> and he, they brought it over, and it was like my world changed. Honestly, that moment of just realizing, wait a minute, I can learn about this stuff. Uh, and I tried it, and Log of Ulan, if you don't know, Isla Scotch, very, very smoky. And it's, it's, a, it's a smoky taste but it's complex in that it doesn't just try and punch you in the mouth with smoke. Um, there's a flavor to it, um, a uh, uh, kind of a slightly green sort of flavor. Um, and it's not, it, while it's, it's smoky, it's not ashy, so it, it's not uncomfortable. Um, and it just, it tasted like a winter evening, which is what it was at the time. And I loved it. And I still look back to that moment as being the time I was like, yeah, I'm going to get serious about this. So you mentioned um, some of the flavors, like uh, some whiskey is smoky, some whiskey has a peat flavor, some whiskey doesn't, and someone have tr has tried one of those flavors, maybe they don't like that flavor, and they think they don't like whiskey. And yeah. that's not sort of the case. No, that's not always the case. As a matter of fact, I always, so I will teach classes, you know, one of the things that we do at McGregor's is we have classes uh, to invite people to come in and just to talk about it, and sometimes I'll do it, or Joel will do it, our bartender, uh, the, who's managing our cannabis location, or we'll have distillers coming in. Um, and, uh, and so they'll come in and they'll talk to people about it. And one of the things I always do when I'm starting a class is I will say to people, look, I know how you can be intimidated when somebody sits down and they know all about bourbon or they know all about scotch and they want to talk about it. Let me tell you something. The difference between a connoisseur and a beginner is simply vocabulary. Wow. Like Connoiss that. Yeah, connoisseur knows how to describe stuff. And a beginner often doesn't. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try and educate you a little bit just to think about vocabulary. So when you nose it, what do you smell? And then I'll ask people, just tell me, just shout out, what are you smelling when you... And, you know, somebody will say lemons, orange peel, uh, grass, leather... You know, they'll come out, you know, wood, they'll come out with different things. Great, write those down. And then the second stage, then, now, I want you to put it in your mouth and just kind of swish it around a little bit. What's it feel like? Is, you know, because some things are oily, some things are smooth, some things are sharp, some things sting a little bit. Now, swallow it and breathe. Now, tell me the flavors that you're getting. What are the flavors that you get when you, you know, and again, people will shout the words out and everything. And then... Um, and then there's the, the aftertaste. Okay, now you, you've, you've nosed it, you sloshed it around a little bit, you sipped it, and now as you breathe, all right, what's the finish like? And again, people will start saying, oh, now it's like, oh, I really get dried fruit. I get cherries from that. Oh, it's really, you know, or they'll talk about how it feels. It's really smooth. This one really burned as it went down. And so then I can say to them, see, now what you're doing is, you are turning into an expert because you're figuring out the vocabulary because that's what you want to do. And the reason we do it, the reason I have people shout things out is because oftentimes, you know, you'll try something and you just don't know. And then you hear somebody else say, vanilla. Oh, that's what it was. It's vanilla. I was trying to figure out what it was that I smelled. Or somebody will say, um, 
it's it's leather. Yes, that's exactly what it is. That, that, there's a leather note to it. That yeah, and uh, so that's what it is. Getting people talking, especially in a group, when they can hear what other people's perceptions are, just a fascinating time. Something you mentioned uh, that I want to cover, um, and we can talk about another one of your secret weapons. Um, just as you were opening, um, you and Lynn, who is one of your secret weapons, I'll let you tell us who Lynn is, but you guys went to bartending school. So first tell me about Lynn, and then let's talk about bartending school. Yeah, Lynn Kyrus um, is one of the absolute uh, biggest reasons that we're successful here in Manzanita. Uh, Lynn and her husband had started a, uh, a burrito restaurant, a Mexican restaurant here in town. And uh, they had run it for 25 years. So she knew how to run a restaurant. She knew about staffing. She knew about getting along, you know, meeting the county health codes and all that kind of stuff. Things that I wasn't as familiar with because I'd spent my life with books. And uh, so when we were opening and she was kind of stepping away from that, so Holly and I went and just asked her, hey, would you be interested in, uh, uh, in working with us? And she said, yes, she would. And so Lynn's been with us really since day one, from the day we really got serious about opening this place. So be long before we opened. And so I said to her, uh, you know, she, she knew the restaurant side, but she didn't necessarily know whiskeys. And I said, let's go to bartending school together. So she and I drove into Portland, spent two weeks taking bartending classes so we could figure out how to make drinks. And Lynn has become a great bartender. Uh, what was that? I've always wanted to either go to culinary school for fun and maybe write about it. Uh, don't want to cook professionally. And I also thought about bartending school. What was that experience like? Yeah, it's uh, it's great because um, it takes the the science of it and the technical part of it, and it breaks it down into pieces. So that when you are looking at a line of drinks, and it's not like you have to, I have to make this one drink, and I have to, and then I'm going to fall, I'm going to put those bottles away, and I'm going to make this drink, because I hadn't, until I went to bartending school, I hadn't really thought about. Wait a minute, I got five drinks I've got to make, but Three of them all need rye. So I can just pull the bottle out and I can put the rye in these three and, and prepare those. So in, in other words, it got us thinking about it and uh, figuring out how to get organized. And then, you know, how to be creative, too. Well, and I want to emphasize the importance of someone like Lynn. And uh, tell me if I'm wrong about her contribution here. But uh, a lot of brewers, before they open a brewery, they could make really good beer at home. Uh, and you, they open up a brewery and they can be really good beer. And that's half of what it takes to succeed. You also have to run the business side of right. your brewery. Right. You know, I do the craft beer podcast as well. And so, uh, if you have, I've seen a lot of great bartenders open up bars that fail because they couldn't run the business side. They didn't exactly. know how to run a restaurant or run a bar, which is very different than making amazing cocktails. And that's where Lynn really brings her expertise. Am I right? Absolutely. Being able to figure out just, just in terms of like, like say meeting the county requirements, um, and, uh, and ordering stuff. She had the connections for ordering food. I knew what food I wanted. So for example, I said to her, I want to have a pate board. Nobody around here has a pate board. And some people don't like pate, but pate tends to be, um, again, a bit of an upscale kind of food and people who want a small plate, they'll often really like pate. And so it's like, let's go down to Olympic provisions in Portland, which specializes in specialty meats and everything. Let's try a bunch of things and introduce ourselves to them. Same with the cheeses. We want to do a cheese board. And we, you know, we want to do a charcuterie board. We want to do a cheese board. So it's like, let's sit down with somebody who really knows this and have them teach us. Lynn was great at that. Uh, what, what, you, are, you are lucky. You've got oh, a lot of great people. you got your wife. you got Lynn. you got a lot of good people on your team. Yeah. Um, and, and every time I've had a really good experience here... Um, uh, I've talked to someone that really knows whiskey a couple years ago I was here and there was a bartender who here may not still be here, but he was so interesting and phenomenal. I just think it's a, it's a gift to surround yourself with interesting people. Like I don't think I've met Joel yet, but now I want to meet Joel. I bet he has a great story and I bet he'd yeah. be fun to let him tell me about a whiskey he loves. And, I'm jo just and Joel is really into, that's been one of the interesting things. We've got a couple of people working for us who are, um, we're referring to as our whiskey sommeliers. And the reason is because they've gotten so into learning about it and, and they will know the story. And it's always fun. Um, so this is an interesting thing. I've always been, I've always been able to appreciate somebody who knows more about something than I do. Whereas some people get threatened by that. That's just not my nature. I love meeting somebody who can really get into this and dig into it and give the story and everything. So Gabe is uh, working up in Canada beach and if, We'll, we'll sit down and we'll start talking about something and all of a sudden he'll tell me the story about, oh, you know, one of the cool things about 
you know, Tyr Connell, which happens to be the uh, Irish whiskey, which is sitting here on the bar, you know, they've always got a, a racehorse on the label. And the reason is because when they were just down and really struggling and everything, the guy, the distiller, took all the money out of the till and he went down and he betted on a horse <laughs> at long odds and it came in and he told he told the other employees, the fact is because it came in, we'll always have a racehorse on our label. It, so it's those kind of things that just, it's just fun. It's part of the, it's, it's part of the, uh, the milieu of, of uh, the whiskey world. Yeah. I have a, um, a friend, uh, Kimberly Johnson, her husband own a, um, uh, a craft beer uh, tap house um, in Vancouver, Washington. And if I'm up in that kind of woods, I'll walk in and I'll have Kimberly tell me what to drink. I know a little bit about beer, but I'll have her tell me what to drink because she has an incredible palate and what she picks is great. I, I, if I'm there, I'm, is Joel or Gregory here? And I'm going to say, okay, I want you to tell me what to get. And I don't really don't care what it is because I want the story and I want to taste it through their yeah. eyes, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Um, what's your favorite kinds of whiskey? So it depends on the day. You know, on a, uh, here at the Oregon coast, when we get a cold, wet, blustery day, I will often like something smoky like a smoky scotch but on a a hot summery day then that's not the appeal that i've got i probably would like something a little sweeter a little lighter some kind of a bourbon so is and i happen to have one of those palettes where i can i can appreciate different things on different days and i know some people are like no i always have to have the same thing which is fine there's nothing wrong with that you know uh, different strokes different folks um but I do have some things that are favorites of mine. Uh, on the bourbon front, I'm a huge Elmer T. Lee fan. I think Elmer T. Lee is just a, just a great bourbon. Um, it's from the old Stitzel Weller uh, distillery. And, uh, uh, man, I love it. Um, so uh, on the rye, I'm a huge Whistlepig fan. I think that when Dave put Whistlepig together, it was just uh, a brilliant move. And I like all of his high-end stuff. Um, and with scotches, um, you know, um, I'm not necessarily a sweets person, uh, whereas some people like kind of a sweeter scotch and everything. Um, I tend to like something that's got a little more complexity to it. Um, so I'm a, a big fan of, of Ardbeg, of some of the different Ardbeg you know, scotches. So like I say, depends on the day. So before we transition into talking about the food, which is insane and off the chart and a little bit about a whiskey. I did mention that you spent your life in the literary world and um, uh, books. I love books. I've, all, I've loved books so much my whole life. Real books. I can't do books on a computer. I need the real book. I need the paper. I'm old now. That's how I do it. Um, and so for just just for people that are wondering, what's a literary agent that don't know? What is a literary agent? Just in simple English. So in simple English, what I do is I talk to people who have a book idea and some writing talent, and then I help them with whatever they need to get their manuscript written, and then I represent them and sell them to a publisher. Uh, I negotiate the deal, ensure contract compliance, and then I'm paid a percentage for doing that. So when you think about it this way, as an, if you were going to do a, a book, um, you might know all about you know, craft distilling, for example, or craft brewing, but maybe not so much about uh, the publishing side or intellectual property rights or something. Whereas the publisher has teams of lawyers and accountants and editors on, on his or her side, who do you have? Well, <laughs> those people who I represent, they have me. That's amazing. And um, I know that you've, you've done a lot of teaching of helping people how to get published, and you have a couple books out, mentioned a couple of them, and I'll put links. Uh, if you go to www.culinarytreasurepodcast.com, I'll have an article, and then I'll have links to where you can buy Chip's books. If you're, oh, sure. Lots of people want to want to write, and they want to become published, and so tell me the names of those books, and I'll link them. So I had a blog, which was really popular for a number of years, and uh, people would send in questions on how to answer them. And so I finally put a bunch of those together with Holly's help, by the way, as my co-author. And we did a book called 101 Questions You've Always Wanted to Ask About Publishing. And, um, uh, and then the other book that I put together was called Step-by-Step uh, -step Pitches and Proposals. And that is simply a book about how do you put together a book proposal? How do you pitch that to a publisher? So, yeah, I'll give you the information so you can put Yeah, I'll put the them. links and Absolutely. people can get it. Available um, on Kindle or Word and Print. I'm blessed to be a published author, and I'm at best a mediocre writer. Uh, you know, my wife's an incredible writer. I have a friend, Jeff Allworth, who wrote The Beer Battle, incredible writer. And I just, I love really great writers, but I don't care. I'm a published author. I'm happy. 
uh, uh, working on a book right now about dive bars, which is a lot oh, of fun. fun. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, you know, I never thought I would be a writer because, you know, I had a, a bad English teacher. I just thought I can't do it. And I was able to overcome that. So, you know, it, I'm just the opposite. Um, I'm the youngest in the family. So, you know, my mom and dad had six kids together. My dad had two others. I'm the youngest of eight total. And um, neither of my parents went to high school. Um, my dad had, uh, you know, eighth grade education. Uh, my mom dropped out her sophomore year. And again, this was a different era. They are a lot older than me because I'm the youngest of so many kids. And, um, but they loved words and they read a lot. My mom and dad read all the time. And so I was introduced to words, but not necessarily to education. And, uh, I still remember I was a sophomore in high school and Tom Day, my English teacher, uh, he read something that I wrote and he told me, this is really good. You could be a writer someday. Wow. And I was so excited. It's like, this is great. And I went home and I remember telling my mom and she said to me, you know, when you were five years old. Uh, no, well, you, you were six years old. You, uh, you were in first grade and you came home and you said to me, you know, when I grow up, I'm going to be a book guy. And, uh, so she, and she, she still remembered that, you know, so, and that's exactly what happened. I grew up, I was a book guy. Yeah. And uh, you love whiskey, but you also love books. I do. <laughs> My two great loves. <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay. Let's talk about the menu, uh, the food. I'm in here, the first time I'm in here, and I look up, and I'm like, what the heck? They got they got lobster bisque on the menu. They don't have a kitchen. There's, like, nothing back there. This Come on, this can't be real. The lobster bisque, I get it almost every time, whether I need it or not. It blows my mind. It's absolutely incredible. Tell me why in the heck lobster bisque is on the menu. So, as we were opening, we wanted to do something, like I say, that was a bit upscale. So, we wanted to have, um, we wanted to do boards and bowls. Um so kind of a tapas flavor. So, you know, we had a cheese board. We we're going to have a potato board. We we're going to have a shakiri board. And then I had said we could do bowls. We could do a mac and cheese bowl, which is popular and filling and everything. We do a fresh soup every week. And somebody said, oh, you should do a lobster bisque. And we tried a couple that weren't very, very good. And then we found somebody who could make this for it with a little sherry in it. Oh, our lobster bisque is amazing. It, oh. it is phenomenal. Yeah. It's worth... Coming here just for that. Um, yeah. And I love your small plates and sides. Um, those are really good. Of course, I had the mac and cheese, which is good. In fact, uh, uh, the last time I was here, um, I sat outside. You know, we're social distancing right now, and I was across. There's a couple across the way. And he ordered three mac and cheeses. Two, one to eat now, and two to go. Because he <laughs> yeah. loves it. And he says he, they come out hiking about once a month the Oregon coast. They make sure they can get back here before you close. And he always he orders three. Oh, that's great. Because he loves the mac and cheese so much. Well, huh? my, my favorite is, so... Um, Jamie at Pacific Pies in Portland makes our pot pies for us and uh, makes them fresh every week. And my favorite, we make, she makes a lamb pot pie, which I think is to die for. Um, I, you know, she makes our pasties for us and she makes our pot pies. And now we're starting to work so, in Pacific Pies in Portland. And now we're starting to work with Bucket Bites uh, in Astoria to also make some pasties for us. Now, a pasty, that's, a, that's an ode to your heritage. For those yeah, that don't know, tell absolutely. us about, tell us about yeah. a pasty. For those that don't know, I've eaten, we used to have pasty food carts in Portland, so I yep. was lucky enough to have them. But tell for those that don't know. Yeah, pasties is a pocket sandwich, if you will. And absolutely, growing up, I mean, yeah. So Cornwall, right? One yeah, of the places? Exactly, yeah. When I was in when I was in grad school, so I was at, I was at Regents Park College uh, at Oxford um, when I was in grad school and uh, just fell in love with pasties and Popeyes because you can get a pocket sandwich which has, you know, it's got some lamb or it's got veggies or it's got, you know, steak and cheese and it's got potatoes and, um, and it's all wrapped up uh, like in a pocket. Uh, and, and I think our pasties are great. And we always do a vegetarian. We always keep a vegetarian one on hand because we have a lot of people in town, of course, who just want a vegetarian meal. And these boards, um, they're kind of unfair. Uh, really, because I just want all of them. The Northwest board, you've got salmon, dried cherries, um, really good Tillamook aged cheddar. Um, your cheese board, right off the top, you start with Rogue Smoky Blue. Rogue Smoky Blue, <sighs> best cheese in the world. Uh, li literally. Uh, lucky enough to do a podcast with Dave Gravels at Rogue. He's a wonderful being. I love him. And you put that Smoky Blue with the right whiskey. Exactly. Oh, it is phenomenal. A lot yeah. of people don't think to pair uh, uh, Blue cheese and whiskey. Exactly. Great. I will tell, I will remind people. And, and by the way, I should say Nan, uh, who has worked with us since we opened as well. I love Nan Devlin. Yep. Visit Tillamook Coast. She does a phenomenal job. And She's also hands in the North Coast food trail. And She's so, amazing. You know, helping us put this stuff together so that the 
you know, I have said to people so many times, the cheese board, the charcuterie board, something a little, you know, you, you get a little like soppressetto or you get a little of the uh, triple cream brie. They will, they will pair beautifully with a whiskey. And a lot of people don't realize that. They're thinking, I think people struggle with, aside from like some kind of a super salty food, you know, a, a pretzel or something like that. They're not sure what to have with whiskey. And it's like, oh, yeah, there's a way to make this work. By the way, I should mention, if you uh, come out to visit McGregor's in Cannon Beach, we have a much bigger kitchen, a little bit of a different uh, food uh, options because we have, um, we do halibut fish and chips, which are great. And, yeah, <laughs> and, um, and we actually make our own clam chowder. And I say that only because everywhere you go on the Oregon coast, you know, people will serve clam chowder, but it's, it's always out, out, it's out of a can. And Poyo, our, our chef uh, there in Cannon Beach, he makes clam chowder every morning and it's got, it's real clams. And I, I swear there's nothing in it, but clams and cream. It is so good. I, I am so glad to have, you know, I kind of, um, uh, I love fish and chips and I've been eating fish and chips up and down the Oregon coast. I just did a podcast today with Riverside Fish and Chips here in Nahalem. They are some of the best fish and chips I've ever had. I like um, Pelican's fish and chips, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give your fish and chips a try. Um, and I agree with you completely about you know um, clam chowder being made for real, right? And I love a good clam chowder. It might be too warm today, but I'll suffer through and eat it anyways. Uh, try but, uh, try the clam chowder in Cannon Beach. So we don't have it here. I said oh, I will. I'll go to, I, I will definitely. No, we don't do that. we don't have a fryer here, so we can't do. But we'll, and are the we'll, boards somewhat similar? The boards boards very similar. We'll, we'll um, Mix up the cheese sometimes, or we'll mix up uh, some of the meats on the charcuterie board, but uh, but they're similar. And, and this pate board, I love Olympia Provisions, their roasted pork riette, and you've got it there on the pate board. I know you mentioned this already once, but a pate board, you've got cornichon on it. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Again, uh, we wanted to do something that was really upscale and really good and something, you know, if you're going to have fine whiskey, then you should have fine food. And let's, you know, and, and that's why it's so funny because the comment we get all the time is, well, you know, you really should have like a cheeseburger. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can get a cheeseburger and fries anywhere. But you can't get that amazing lobster bisque or fresh, real clam chowder or, anywhere. Yeah, midnight moon aged Gouda, you know, uh, or the uh, um, uh, the uh, Alexian's pheasant duck pate is fantastic. It's just so good. <laughs> okay, desserts. It's just unfair. <laughs> um, uh, the Scottish shortbread with the, the whiskey caramel sauce. That is amazing. It's perfect with the whiskey. Those are fantastic. Thanks. I love those. By the way. We tried about seven, seven or eight places uh, for shortbread, and they didn't make. And I grew up with shortbread, Scottish family, and uh, they couldn't. They just couldn't get it right. And I finally met this woman um, who runs uh, Julianne's uh, Irish Bakery in Tigard, and she made shortbread. And as soon as I tried, I was like, "It's just like my mom made it," you know. And so now. Um, her name is Lana and Lana who would love to listen to this podcast. So I'm going to do a shout out for her. She's retired now, but she continues to make shortbread for one client and that's, uh, McGregor's. You are brilliant in surrounding yourself with gifted people. That is, that's fantastic. You know, before we opened, um, it was one of the things that Holly and I talked about was like, boy, there's no place to go get a really good dessert. There were some, you know, like I say there were pubs in town and everything, but we wanted, we wanted some choice on really good desserts. And so, like our chocolate bourbon hazelnut pie, oh, it's fantastic. I've had that. That's phenomenal. And the sti sticky toffee cake yeah. is phenomenal. <laughs> now, and your rich flourless chocolate cake is really good, but I can get flourless right. chocolate cake anywhere. Yeah, but we had to have something chocolate on there. Yep. When we first opened, we were working with a chocolatier out of Portland, but it just became, uh, it, frankly, it just became too much work yep. because it's, uh, the chocolate's got to really be fresh. You know, and the pies, um, Sister well, and Pete's, just yep. up the river, or right. up the river, just up the road. Right. Up the road, yeah. And they always have a different one. Right. Uh, like right now, I'm looking up and it's a strawberry rhubarb, but yep. it, I've had peach, I've had all, just whatever Mary seasonal. Berry. Yep. Yep. Um, so, and I love a good pie. Um, you know, the flour chocolate cake's good, but the things that I just rarely find that are as good, you know, the chocolate bourbon hazelnut pie, the stiffy toffee, nobody has sticky toffee cake. Right. Uh, and then you've got the one that you, that people love to talk about at the bottom of the dessert menu. The spotted dick. <laughs> so I grew up with spotted dick, which as you know, is it's just a pound cake, which has currants, uh, which are ground up in it. So it's got little spots in it. And so the, the term coming from the UK was a spotted dick. But of course I... I've always had it because I grew up with it and I, I love it. But more than anything, I, I like when people order it. 
so that I get to walk in here and say, I've got a spotted dick and wait for people or, you know, hey, do you want to try my spotted dick? Um, yeah. So, so it's got, it's got the cake and it's got the Devonshire cream. Oh, and, and by the way, that, that's not a made up thing. We actually, we really do order in actual Devonshire cream from Devonshire, England so that we can, <laughs> we, you know, that's a true story. <laughs> Okay, we're going to talk about the, the, the food is fantastic. And are the desserts Thank similar you. at Cannon Beach? Uh, desserts are very similar at Cannon Beach. You know, I mean, we, we try and mix it up so it's not exactly the yeah, same. Yep. Um, uh, they have uh, sometimes had, for example, a, a dessert pasty up there. Uh, we were doing a, a j- uh, Jamie at uh, Pacific Pies was making us a, just a great uh, cherry filled um, uh, dessert pasty, which was great. Wow. That sounds amazing. So for those that, a lot of people, they love wine, but their partner does. I mean, they love a lot. A lot of people, they love whiskey, but their partner doesn't. Um, so she'll come in here with her sniffing other. She loves whiskey and maybe, you know, her wife doesn't. And so you've got, you've got wine on the menu. You've got beer on the menu. You've got a good selection of those. Very impressive. So people have options. I just want people to know that. Um, but you've got right at the front of the menu, you've got these cocktails. Um, and I've, I've felt like it was my duty to kind of drink my way through some of them. Um, <laughs> this is my responsibility. Um, the black Manhattan, that was really interesting. That's the best, that's the best cocktail on here. Well, I will argue with that about that, but it is a very good one. Um, Rittenhouse rye. I love Rittenhouse yep. rye. Um, and then Averna, that kind of surprised me. Yeah. So Averna is a, a Sicilian Amaro and um, it's very dark and bitter, so there's no uh, sweet vermouth in this Manhattan. It's just you know, two parts Rittenhouse, uh, one part Averna, um, with some Angostura bitters. Oh, it makes a great dark Manhattan, really rich flavor. Um, and another one that I loved was the um, dark cherry whiskey sour. So that's been on the menu since the day we opened. That was, uh, I, I'm going to credit Lynn with, uh, with creating that. Um, Take Buffalo Trace, um, put some organ bean cherries and have them soak in the Buffalo Trace so that it's got a, a genuine uh, bean cherry flavor rather than that artificial, so the super sweet taste that you sometimes get with uh, with people's whiskey sours. Uh, we make the sour fresh here every day. And, uh, and we used to make it with egg white, but now we're using aquafava, uh, you know, a, basically a, a, a bean dip, uh, which... Uh, Gives the little, the strength, the structure to the drink and everything. Oh, so good. And oh, I'm not going to talk to the entire cocktail menu, but I could. I'll just mention two more. Um, the Blackberry Smash. I've had that on a warm summer day. It is perfect on a warm summer day. Bullet bourbon, Cointreau, a little back, blackberry puree, some yeah. mint syrup. It's awesome. Really refreshing. Really refreshing. But my favorite, the one that I, I, one of my favorite, I love a gin martini first in my life. And then my second favorite cocktail is a good old fashioned. And you guys nail the old fashioned. And I've had lots of bad old fashions. And so that's why probably I love it so much when it's really good. Your old fashioned's phenomenal. And we do it a little different. You know, so we call it max old fashioned. We'll make a regular, a standard old fashioned for somebody who wants it. And we, uh, but, uh, uh, but yeah, max old fashioned uses four roses. So before I opened, I said to people, there's two whiskeys we're going to have here all the time. We're going to have everything I can get from Michter's because I love Michter's. Um, and uh, we're going to introduce people to Four Roses because people, bars in Oregon and Washington just weren't using Four Roses products. And when I lived in Nashville, I developed a great appreciation for Four Roses. So we use Four Roses small batch. We take a, we, we take a cherry uh, and uh, an orange and we actually muddle them. So it's got a fresh fruit taste to it, which is a little different than some people's old fashioned. Yeah, I, I love that old fashioned. I know yeah. it is a little bit different. Just one quick thing here. By the way, you should know before we opened, this is a credit to Holly and Lynn. So before we opened, I thought, look, we're just we're gonna be selling pours of whiskey to people. And <laughs> and Lynn and Holly were like, No, Chip, people are gonna come here for craft cocktails. And so we kind of put this craft and we change it. Uh, every season we change the cocktails. But I honestly um I sort of discounted this. Well, of course, half of our business is craft cocktails. Well, and craft cocktails are fun. Yeah, I mean, exactly. They're, and they're there, you know, and I, I love when people, when they have a cocktail list, because I know, I know cocktails, but I want to read about how you did it in the description and, oh, I've never had that before. Oh, I didn't think about doing it that way. That's the joy of going out to a nice upscale bar. Like, I'm so glad that um, uh, uh, Lynn and Holly. Holly were able to help sell you on that. Yeah. That's important. So you've got, we won't cover them all, but you've got more than 10 flights 
People can get, you know, a number of little glasses set before them with all different kinds of flights. Pick out a couple. I can't. I, I want to drink all of them. Pick out a couple of your flights. We'll talk about just one or two of them. So, before again, um, when people come in, we want to introduce them to, to things. So, for example, uh, I, uh, if you have a Manhattan, you've got three ounces of liquor in it. If you've got an old-fashioned, you've three ounces of liquor in it. So, having a flight, um, you get three one-ounce pours. So, it's like having one cocktail. But, like, with the Scotch flight, um, you know, you've got five different regions of scotches so there's three of them on the board here so there's there's a, a highland um there's an isla uh and there's there's a uh, uh there's a lowland scotch on here and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to give people different flavors so they can try an ardbeg an isla which is a really smoky one they can try uh an isla jura which is uh a highland right on the right on the border of the island area and everything um far less smoky um, finished in a sherry cask, it's got a little sweetness to it, and then and then a Kleinlich, which is a super super clean, not smoky at all kind of Scotch. Uh, so you can do you can do flights that way. We can do the same thing with uh, with a bourbon flight where we try different. Uh, you know, we, we put different bourbons on there, something which is really really smooth, something a little sharper. Um, uh, but of course, I mean. The two things that people want to talk to us about, of course, are Oregon flights because we are very much in Oregon and try try to connect to all of the distillers here in Oregon, try and have them in, and then the Japanese flight. So before we opened, just so you know, I had no intention of having Japanese whiskey. Didn't know anything about it. And a friend of mine, a guy who owns a whiskey bar in Lexington, Kentucky, right on the Bourbon Trail, he said to me, now, Chip, you've got to do this. You've got to put Japanese whiskeys on your list. He said, at least have a flight. So I got in three Japanese whiskeys and I just created a flight. So we've been open four years. In the four years we've been open, I have sold more Japanese whiskey flights than any other flight, which I never would have expected that we'd sell more of those than we would have Scotch flights or Irish flights. And, and Japanese whiskey is phenomenal. All right, and we'll talk about it. So you open the menu and you've got a huge selection of Scotch whiskeys, you know, broken down by region. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got some American whiskey. You've got bourbon. You've got rye. I just kind of give people a sense of it. Um, and then you turn the page and it keeps going. You've got more rye. You've got Japanese whiskey. You've got Indian whiskey. Um, you've got Irish whiskey. You've got Canadian whiskey. There's a French whiskey on here. Oh, there is a fr Where's that? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's listed on the flight there. It, oh, wow. Yeah. You yeah. got a French whiskey. That's incredible. It's not that incredible, as a matter of fact. Just between you and no, me. No, no, I meant the, 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 the depth of whiskey, so they're available. It, that I appreciate. Three Bastille, pages. the French whiskey, is not necessarily going to knock your socks off. But the Amrut, the Indian whiskey, is great. All right, so I'm going to give you a hard job. All right. Pick one of the Scotch whiskeys from the, from the menu where people get a pour that you really think we should mention, particularly for... Um, for whiskey aficionados who know their whiskey, they come in here and they could get a shot of one of these Scotch whiskeys. What's the one you'd pick? He's looking. He's looking at the wall. He's trying to decide. I've given him an impossible task. Okay, so a um, couple of different ways to think about it. So I'll be short. One of them is um, if they really want a, a good, rich, complex Scotch, they should look at the Glen Farkless 25. I know you hear the word 25 and you think it's got to be crazy expensive, but the fact is it's, it's not necessarily crazy expensive. It's just really, really good. Um, the um, Brooklotic uh, Octomore is fantastic. Uh, I know if you're going to get a bottle these days, you're going to have to get a second mortgage on your home. But one of the reasons why we keep high-end whiskeys here is so that people can come in and if they can't spend you know eighteen hundred dollars for example uh, on a, a bottle of some really rare whiskey maybe they can spend 60 bucks and and get a, a pour and see what it's like i i love that i'm gonna pick one off the american whiskey list um just because i love them and they're uh, up in hood river westward american spirit oh, yeah. malt single malt uh the people up there at westward are amazing um uh I got to get myself their new podcast with them. And and the fact is, uh, they've got uh, we carry the the American single malt, but we also uh, have carried their stout. Um, it's a uh, stout cask. Oh, it's fantastic! It's just really good. Westward is such a nice product. All right, and I'm give you one from the bourbon list. Looks like there's more than fifty on here, so that's going to be hard for you to pick one. But come on now, tell people about one of them. Okay, um, if you're if 
you haven't tried Michter's, M-I-C-H-T-E-R, and most Americans uh, in the West uh, here haven't tried Michter's. It's much more of a Southern thing, but you really should try it. It's smooth. It's sweeter. It's on that sweeter range of uh, of bourbons. And, you know, Michter's small batch, you know, two ounce pour is only $15. But I will tell you, one of the best whiskeys I've got on in on the premises here, Michter's 10-Year, which is a little pricier, you know. I mean, that's an expensive bottle. But it is, I think, I say right on the menu, arguably one of the best bourbons on the planet. It's just so good. But So try Michter's. Try Michter's Small Batch sometime. A little sweeter, very smooth, great flavor. So the next section, I'm going to pick one out, rye. Um, I, oh, love, I know what you're picking. I, know, I love a good rye whiskey. And last time I was here... Um, uh, I, I looked at the menu and I, I, it stuck out to me. Uh, Angels Envy Caribbean Rum Cask. Oh, wait a minute. They put, I love rum, and they put um, rum, uh, they put whiskey in a rum barrel. And then I saw the McGregor's favorite whiskey. So I asked the, you know, the server, the bartender, I was like, is this real? It's just like, no, 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 it's their favorite. It's okay. I want, I want that. It's Holly's. It, it used to uh, say. Holly's a whiskey genius. Yeah. It used to say Holly's uh, favorite whiskey. And, and it is. She just loves that. You got an Indiana rye. Uh, aged in a Crujan rum cask. Oh, it's fantastic. And most people just... So right now, in the whiskey world, I mean, rye is where it's at. Everybody's doing incredibly uh, creative things uh, with rye. So, uh, And Japanese whiskey. Um, you know, Nika coffee whiskey is one of my favorite all-time whiskeys. I love that. And you've got quite a good selection of different Japanese whiskeys. Yeah, it's the Hibiki Harmony people should really try. Americans who are trying to have... A, 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 to try and figure out the flavor of Japanese whiskey. Hibiki Harmony is the way to go. It's, um, it's hard to find. Um, it's actually, it's, it's actually matured in a plum liqueur barrel. And so it's got a, a very flower like taste, really good, very delicate. Okay. Uh, do you have one you want to mention in the Scottish, I mean, excuse me, the Irish whiskey side? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, any, anybody, m- most people hear Irish whiskey and they immediately think of Jameson, but, uh, the fact is try, red breast try a red breast 12 sometime and it will blow your mind instead of the you know huge triple distilled in three column kind of thing you've still got a uh, a little copper pot still um and red breast uh you, you know what i always say to people when they come in and try it i'm always like red breast best thing to come out of ireland since lucky charms <laughs> uh, last year someone gave me a, a a bottle of red breast 15 and i was oh, very grateful great uh, stuff Phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, what really impresses me, and this is where it's fun, if someone loves whiskey but their partner doesn't, um, you've got a fun rum selection, um, including a rum near and dear to my heart. You've got Kaloa rum uh, from the island of Kauai. When I was in Kauai, I did a podcast. Bob Gunter uh, helped make the magic happen there at Kaloa. And I literally almost fell out of my seat when I saw on the menu Kaloa rum. I was yeah. like, are you kidding me? Nobody has Kaloa rum. Yeah, Holly and I own a a timeshare uh, in Princeville on the island of Kauai, and we go over every winter and uh, got to know the people at Kaloa, and I think we were the first bar to start carrying them here in Oregon. I'm a huge fan of theirs. We actually have several different uh, Kaloas that we keep. But just so you know, the rum list was something. This was my baby because I I love rum, and I thought, hey, we're a beach town. You know, we love to vacation in Hawaii and the Caribbean and stuff like that. I want it. So at one point we had rums from, I think, 27 different countries. I've had to cut it down because people just are not as rum crazy as I am. Well, and, and you know, to be fair, I love rum, but um, if I'm coming to Whiskey Bar, I'm going to get whiskey. I know, yeah. And it's not a tiki bar where I'd get right. rum. Right. But, uh, but, but the one to try on this list is Kirk and Sweeney 12. I'm telling you, Kirk and Sweeney 12 uh, from Dominican Republic. And it is one of the best whiskeys in this place. It is. It's one of the best whiskeys, even, even though it's rum and it's just made from sugar cane. The fact is, uh, Kirk and Sweeney 12 is a great world-class rum and not expensive, which rum never well, is. Well, the other thing I'd suggest someone do is get the um, Kaloa coffee rum and say, just tell the bartender, could you make me a cocktail, your yep. choice, with the coffee rum? Because that coffee rum is phenomenal. Yeah, they, may, they have a great coffee rum. Yeah, yeah, it's it's um, it is fantastic. And then you've always got um, rare whiskey, special one ounce pours. Um, this is like the super fancy stuff. Yeah, you know, um, for example, I mean, I'll, I'll pull a couple off here. Um, the Colonel E. H. Taylor. I'm a huge Taylor fan. Colonel E. H. E. H. Taylor. Uh, their amaranth. Uh, made from the grain of the gods. And the fact is, it's a one, it was a one time thing. 
right now, if you were going to buy a bottle of that, well, you couldn't buy a bottle because they were all sold. You'd have to get it from a collector. Um, and the going price for that right now, somewhere between eighteen and $2,500 wow. for a bottle. Now, granted, is a, any bottle of whiskey worth 2000 bucks? Probably not. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Exactly right. And I am not a collector. I'm here to sell it. And so we try and put a reasonable price on it and sell it to people so that they'll try it. So, yeah, people come in and there's always, you know, they ask about Pappy Van Winkle. But uh, the fact is we've got, you know, I've got a, a, a Weller CYPB, which is just impossible to find. Create your perfect bourbon. I've got a Shanks, uh, which, again, made by Michter's. And uh, it's only a couple of thousand bottles uh in the country and, and, and you here. have a rare whiskey special one up poor menu in cannon beach right right and so it's kind of like christmas for whiskey goers right whiskey lovers they come here first day one and they get some special one that they'll never be able to get in their lifetime right and they should have the lobster bisque and then the next day they need to go up to cannon beach and get another whiskey they'll only be able to get once in their life and then they get the clam chowder and fish and chips yes and at both places get dessert because the desserts are phenomenal oh thank you so much it's really <laughs> nice to hear her so no it, it's for real and i just i don't i don't give false praise if i don't love something i don't write about it i don't talk about it um it's just such a delight for the whole experience just i don't care if it's warm weather cold weather it's just it's just like a comforting warm blanket the experience here the food the servers the whiskey thank you um i just think actually um i i, I would bet anything uh, that if I got invited to dinner at your and Holly's house, it would be comfortable, it would be warm, it would be nurturing, it would be delightful, and I think it's the love that you and Holly have that kind of spills out into your places. That's, that's, I'm being very sincere when I say that. Oh, that is very correct. Plus, yeah. yeah, plus Holly's a great cook, so there's <laughs> okay. that. All so, right. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to close with uh, what have you poured? What are we going to taste? Okay. I've, been, I've been staring at the whole time. I've resisted sipping it. Uh, now I'm ready. I'm going to take a picture of it, and you tell us about it. Okay, so... Uh, I could. I was trying to figure out if I should just pull something off the top shelf or if I should make something that you just can't get anywhere. So this is a McGregor family drink. This is probably the first whiskey I ever had. Uh, and um, uh, so anytime you walk into a small place, a small restaurant, and the owner says to you, oh, yeah, that's a family recipe, you know, just assume that they bought it at Costco, okay? Uh, this is... Literally a McGregor family recipe. Um, it's a little scotch, so depending on the scotch you use, it's going to taste different. It's a little amaretto. Depending on the amaretto you use, it's going to taste a little different. Um, it's not a rusty nail. Uh, it's got uh, just a few drops of um, drambuie in it. It's got a few drops of a heather liqueur. Uh, and... Um, you blend it together, and then you age it. So you see the barrel, the wooden barrel that's uh, on the bar. So you age yep. it about th three, three and a half weeks. So it's got, it, it, so it picks up a little of the flavor from a charcoal uh, American oak barrel. And then this is what you get. And the nose is fantastic. Yeah. Now you can smell. So depending, again, depending on the, the, the products that you're using, it might be a little smokier. This is made with a Kleinlish and with, uh, so very clean scotch uh, with a DiSerono. Uh, amaretto and um, when you sip so wow that's good enough to drink isn't it that is complex mm -hmm. and smooth at the same time it's all it's it's that kind of smooth where it almost burns but it doesn't I don't even know if I'm making any sense um I'm kind of shocked. I'm taken aback, but in a delightful, really positive way. I want listeners to, to understand that. Hard to believe that's scotch, isn't it? Yeah. And so if someone comes in, they want to order, is this also at Cannon Beach? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is our signature drink. This is a McGregor family special. And so this is. Is that on the menu somewhere? Yeah. If I miss this? Where no, it's, I... it's on the craft cocktail list. We call it Robert the Bruce. And Robert the Bruce, um, we serve it neat or uh, on a rock. And uh, it's cascaged right here on site. And I, I think it's fantastic stuff. I, I really do. This one, the, the, the batch we're trying here, I didn't make because I've been away on vacation here. And so it's a little, little strong on the cherry for me. Um, but, uh, oh, my gosh, this is it's now, such I, a great. I, I love cherry. In fact, in my room last night, you know, I, I try to travel with a martini glass. I, when, I can, when I'm driving, you know, even when I'm driving to Bozeman, I pack my glass martini glass. I've got a, I've got a travel one if I need to. And then when I possible, I keep Manhattan stuff so I can make a Manhattan. Excuse me, an old fashioned. And I had an old fashioned last night, and I added a little extra cherry. I wanted a little bit more cherry last night, given what was going on. And so, 
I, this would be good without cherry, but I, whoever made this, I don't know if which I, one. Yeah, I'm not sure. But. Yeah, whoever did this is this is good. But I hear you. You could I, I could take it either way. Yeah. Um, but now now picture this. Just uh, imagine this being made with a, a smoky scotch instead of a clean scotch. It becomes oh, a totally different drink. Yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. So uh, I think you got to change the name because the Robert the Bruce. I looked at it. I missed it. Eh, whatever. I don't know all this stuff. Eh, next. Uh, which is stupid on my part, but we got to come up with a better name of it because this Robert the Bruce, that's the one people got to have. They so gotta, I'll tell you, they I'll tell you why, the story. It, tell you why it's named Robert the Bruce. Robert the Bruce, of course, uh, the Bruce was the one who uh, first gathered the clans together and united uh, the different uh, families of Scotland. And so the idea here is that this is a uniting of different flavors of scotch. Mm. Thus, Robert the Bruce. Brilliant. Now, have you been to, I assume you've been to Scotland. Oh yeah, sure. We've got family over there still. Yeah, one of the things I want to do is you can, uh, you pro- I'm sure you know this, but you can take um, Highland walking tours um, where you walk three or four hours, uh, but you walk and then you stop and lunch at a pub and then you walk another couple hours and then you give you dinner and a nice bed and breakfast and you do that day after day. And that and, just sounds great to me. And uh, in between uh, all that walking and everything, you're stopping in at distilleries, which is one of the best values in <laughs> Scotland. Stopping in. And it's usually a pound or two, and you get this great tour, plus you get a couple of drinks. Best scotch you ever had, honestly, best scotch you ever had in my life was uh, uh, at the Aberfeldy Distillery. I was there with my daughter, Molly, and my son, Colin. Um, our, my nephew was getting married in a little town of Fintry, and so we, we, we stop. Uh, we're staying in Aberlour, so we stop in the little town of, of Aberfeldy. We go into the distillery. We're the only people there uh, for, the, for the tour that day. And uh, so... The distiller actually takes us around and is showing us stuff. And at the end, he says, you know, I'm supposed to give you a taste of something, but, you know, since you're the only folks here, let me, let me give you something good. And he walks us into the back, and he takes a wooden mallet, pounds out the bung uh, on this big uh, cask of scotch, you know, drops a cylinder in, pours it uh, into a glass just like you've got there. Uh, it's called a Glencairn glass. a special shape for scotch. A fantastic scotch glass. And... Um, and I sipped it, and I'm reading the barrel, and I know that this is 45-year-old Aberfeldy scotch, and it was like mother's milk. It was the best scotch I had ever had in my life, and it, it was just so good. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what you can do when you can visit Scotland. That's one of the things we're going to have to do. We teach classes here, but one of these things, we're going to do a, we're gonna have to do a distillery tour. Now, um uh, yeah, I can't believe I'm going to say this two podcasts in a row, but is there any any church background at all on your journey anywhere? You ever been to church? Oh, or? sure. Okay. Oh, my so, gosh. I'm a seminary grad. Okay. Well, <laughs> that's phenomenal. Um, what the fun discussions we could have. I own more uh, commentaries than you can imagine. Um, uh, lots and lots of them. Um, Reformed? Reformed background? <laughs> nope. Just, but I still, anyways. No kidding. No kidding. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a seminary grad and... Uh, Work to churches, and uh, you bet. Yeah, I spent ten years in the nonprofit world. So okay, yep. Um, so there's a phrase in, in in lots of different tribes of lots of different kinds. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that I was at Regents Park, uh, yep. at Oxford University, doing a postdoc in medieval church history. So that's my background: medieval church history. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so here. for those, sitting, what is this thing that's sitting here behind me? So this? that's my doctoral cowl. Uh, so when you get your doctorate, that's what they put over your shoulders. Yeah. That's so like most people, all they know about cowl is Batman has a cowl. And exactly. And that's yeah. his face. But this is kind of like a scarf. Not, it is. Not, it's just like a scarf. Just like yeah. a scarf. But it, it, it hangs here. Yeah. And some people don't even realize there's um, – I did a podcast with a dive bar in Bozeman, Montana, where there's all this junk hanging on the wall, ceilings. Uh, an adult three-person trike. And every – the owner was kind of private, but he gave us a museum tour of all the stuff hanging up. And it was phenomenal. Love it. Um, and so you've got this hanging up here. Yeah. Tell me about these photos. That I've, I've, I've enjoyed when I've come here, but I don't know the story till today. Oh, yeah. So uh, we – we wanted to put piece, Holly and I wanted to put pieces that meant something to us. And so uh, the paintings that are up, are um, they're all from a book that my family had about the history of the clans of Scotland. And so it shows the different tartans. And the big one in the middle, that's uh, McGregor. That's Rob Roy. I'm a descendant of Rob Roy McGregor. That's Rob Roy. 
Yes. So all these photos are from books from your family stuff. Uh, they're, yeah, they're paintings, not photographs. But yeah, they're, they're all from books. Okay, yeah. now I'm going to take a picture of that uh, yeah. before we go. You can bet your bippy. Uh, tell us what that tattoo says. So my a tattoo on my arm is, has our family motto, which is McGregor despite them. So whenever you get together for a wedding or a funeral or Christmas or something, like that, McGregor's get together, they're always... Um, I'll do the Reader's Digest version. I swear that this will be really short. Okay? I'm happier than a pig right. in mud. So, um, McGregor is the only name that's ever been banned by the English crown. When, when uh, Queen Elizabeth I died, um, and the, the crown went to her cousin, uh, King James VI of Scotland, who became King James I of England, and he, James was feuding with my family um, because he had tried to steal land from us and everything like that. And so, <laughs> he got tired of dealing with McGregor's. And so he passed a series of laws, the laws of prescription, the first law. A um, McGregor man couldn't have a, a knife where the blade was wider than his palm. And the second was it had to have a rounded end so you could cut with it, but you couldn't poke with it, if you will. Uh, and eventually, he just, he outlawed her name. So for 175 years, it was illegal to use the name McGregor uh, in the UK. And we kept our name in secret. And so Robert Burns, the poet uh, of Scotland, this famous poet and songwriter of Scotland, he wrote a song about us. And um, the chorus, we still say, it happened at my wedding, it happened at my uh, uh, my parents' funeral, uh, it happened at my nephew's wedding that I was talking about and everything like that. So we will get together and we'll hold a blade across our palm. And we will say the chorus, which is about how we persisted. While there's leaves in the forest and foam on the river, McGregor, despite them, will flourish forever. Uh, that's phenomenal. I did not know that story. That is, that is not easy to keep a, keep a culture or a history or a language or a name alive over 175 years. Right. Hats off oh, to yeah. your, your clan. If your you go group. to Rob Roy uh, McGregor's, uh, whose uh, painting is up there, if you go to his grave, uh, just outside of Pitt Lockery, where my family is from, it will, uh, you'll see his headstone. It says, Robert McGregor, McGregor despite them. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take a, if you're listening to this podcast, you want to see pictures of these things. I'm going to take pictures of these things. I have pictures of the food and the whiskey from previous visits. I don't have pictures of these things. I'm going to grab some pictures after I pack up my gear. Um, okay, so my closing story, the, the phrase you've probably heard, it's for and lots of different Christian tribes say it. I think I've improved it. Um, the phrase goes, God loves you as a plan for your life. You've heard that, right? Sure. I, I think I've improved that a little bit. You know, I don't know if, you're, uh, you know if your theology is more Calvinist or Armenian as far as, you know, free will. Uh, we won't get into that today, although that's a fun discussion for people that know. Um, but um, I improved it, that God loves you and I have a plan for your life. And I think, you know, roughly uh, 2023 or 2024, we should go to Scotland. I'll do the videography. Uh, we can uh, we can take. I think it'd be fun to take some Oregon whiskey with us and go see. You know, maybe four or five, um, you know, Scotch whiskey places in Scotland and film there and give them each. Oh, here's something from Oregon and tell their stories. I think we'd have a blast. They would love that. And the reason I'll tell you is because a lot of people don't realize Oregon plays a huge role in Scottish distilling. I'm, I'm not making this up. You can go to any Scottish distiller, and when you go, when you first walk in, the the new spirit in sitting in a mash tun and everything like that, go look at the wood. It is all Oregon fur. You're kidding me. No, I, and I was amazed when I first time, first time I went on a distillery tour and I noticed it said product of Oregon. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm from Oregon. Of course, all the Scots are like, what are you talking about? Uh, you know. Where, where where is Oregon? You know, well, it's from the west coast of uh, of the United States, but it's where I'm trying. And then every distiller I have ever been in. So I finally started googling, and it sh turns out, yeah, there's this great tradition of using Oregon wood to make the mash tun that the Scottish distiller. So, so that part, I'm I'm serious for real. I think it'd be a fun trip too. And then this part I can't, but this is now just more spitballing. It'd be fun. But maybe if we took a couple of Oregon distillers with us, like if we took Lee, oh, we yeah. took Lee Medoff oh, with yeah. us. I mean, oh, he would be phenomenal. And he yeah. could hold his own. And that would be just a lifetime of a trip. And we get some great content. Um, and your voice is good enough to co-host a podcast with that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> now, what fun would be to do some video and do some that podcasts. And no, I'm very, very serious. I love creating content. Uh, when I get to go places, you know, when I was in Greece last year, I did a lot of fun. It's just, it's great to find people's stories and share them and tell them. Um, Chip, you are a fantastic storyteller. You've told amazing stories. Um, 
hats off to you and your, uh, your your wife Holly. You put together an amazing thing in your team. Uh, people like um, uh, Lynn, who've helped make it happen here. Uh, Joel, Joel, Gregory, right? Joel, uh, Gabe, yeah, yeah we got some yeah, great you, people. Gabe, yeah. excuse me, yeah, I was got the G part right at least. Yep. Um, uh, and uh, I, I'm gonna have just I'm gonna have to probably write an article uh, sometime about the Robert the Bruce just to sell people on this thing because I I overlooked it and I was foolish because um, that is really really good really good. really good all right well thank you so much for being on the culinary thank you podcast. so much wish you all the best cheers. Mm-hmm.